Panis, but is currently working in Germany, where he is the director of the one of the director of the Max Planck uh, Institute for Astrophysics in Garking, in Munich. Um, Echiro is an expert in uh, the universe, and in particular on the. Uh, the theory of cosmic microwave background that he started to study already as a graduate student at the Tohoku University in Japan, uh, where he started to study problems related to the uh, possible non-Gaussianities in the uh, cosmic microwave background. Now, uh, after that, he went to the US in uh, Princeton, where he joined the WMAP uh, experiment for the cosmic microwave background. Uh, and, of course, he has been one of the driving forces behind that experiment. You see many, many papers that, uh, in which Echiro has contributed substantially. Uh, after that, he became an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, and he founded the Texas Cosmology Center, a very uh, highly, scientific, uh, uh, highly scientifically respected uh, uh, sub-institution of the University of uh, Texas. And finally, he moved to, uh, recently, he moved to Germany, to the Max Planck, where, as I said, is the is uh, director. He's now involved in many uh, new projects, uh, particularly searching for a large-scale structure with a new experiment called EDDEX. And uh, so today, uh, he will tell us about uh, the uh, critical test uh, theory of the early universe using the cosmic microwave background. I have to add that uh, Ichiro has also received many prizes, and the last one, I guess, I think, has been the Yukawa uh, Prize in Japan, and so uh, we are very happy to have him here and uh, listen to his talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Andrea, for a kind introduction. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's uh, my uh, pleasure to uh, visit PISA for my first time. And uh, I already uh, explored the uh, exciting uh, nightlife in PISA last night. Thanks to students in Cosmology Group, I really uh, uh, enjoyed that. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about what this um, little space telescope, that's WMAP, Wilkinson Microwave and Isotropy Probe, it's a NASA's uh, space telescope, which already completed the mission. So I'm going to report to you the final results and one of the highlights of the uh, experiment, namely what we learned about the beginning of our universe. So what I work on is cosmology, and uh, cosmologists ask very old questions. Uh, how old is the universe? How big is it? If there is any finite size, how big is it? What shape does it take? What is it made of? How did it begin? And these are really the old questions that the human beings were asking uh, since many, many years ago. But finally, the breakthrough came. Uh, and what I really want to convince you, using the, uh, the, some of the data we took, uh, uh, that uh, um, we can now finally directly observe the physical condition of the early universe. Now, I'm going to tell you about what we know about the beginning of the universe, but I don't want you to get the wrong impression that I'm just, you know, bullshitting, or I'm just uh, saying things that I imagine, right? That, that period of time is over. We have a picture of the universe when it was very, very young. This is the direct measurement experiment that tells you uh, what the universe was like uh, uh, billions of years ago. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, so we use cosmic micro background, and that's really the fossil light of the Big Bang. And in a nutshell, what we do is very, very simple. So uh, because light propagates at a finite speed, uh, if you look at objects at great distance, you are looking at that object when it was still young. Because you know, light takes time to travel. So farther away you look, the older the objects uh, that you look. 
they essentially, we have done the following. We wanted to see great, 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 great distances. Then we managed to do that, and we ended up observing actual picture of the universe when it was young. That's all. That's, what, that's all we do, and that's what I'm going to present. Now, before we get to the data, let me just show you the animation, which is not a computer simulation of any kind. It's just a cartoon I took from the uh, DVD called Cosmic Voyage. That's the IMAX theater movie created for science education and it's narrated by Morgan Freeman. Uh, it's a very good DVD. But I was stunned by the quality and accuracy of this particular DVD, that the scene that I'm going to show you. And this pretty much tells you everything about what I'm going to say. And I'm going to refine that view by providing you with the actual data we have taken. So let the universe begin. So universe began, was born, and it's very hot, rapidly expanding. And uh, as the universe expands, it cools down. It's an adiabatic cooling. So when the size of the universe doubles, temperature becomes half. So as the universe keeps expanding, keeps cooling, but the universe back then was pretty opaque. Uh, up until the, uh, when temperature falls down to about 3,000 kelvins, the universe becomes transparent to photons. Because before this epoch, there are lots of electrons scattering photons by Thomson scattering, and the photons cannot propagate freely. But after 3,000 kelvins, uh, universe, uh, the electrons are combined into hydrogen atoms, which do not scatter photons very much, and the universe became transparent to photons. That's what you just saw. Then, but the important thing I want you to also know is that the universe wasn't really homogeneous to begin with. You saw already ripples, fluctuations, primordial fluctuations, which existed right after the beginning of the universe, birth of the universe. And these fluctuations now grew gravitationally, and they form objects. Now, according to, and this is also a very precise thing about this uh, movie, uh, surprisingly. So according to the standard scenario that we have now, Small things form first, then uh, small things collide with each other to form bigger and bigger ones. Eventually, these big uh, blobs will become a galaxy that we live in. And there are numerous galaxies out there, not just ours. And uh, in the meantime, the universe keeps cooling, and the present day temperature of the cosmic micro background, the first light of the Big Bang, is about three degrees, three Kelvin. And you know, I guess that's our Andromeda, the, uh, that's our Andromeda, the nearby galaxy, that's our Milky Way. They collide and do kind of stuff. But this is now two, two cartoons, so let me skip it. But you get the basic picture. Eh? So basically, uh, this light that existed many years ago, universe was still very hot. These photons didn't go anywhere. They're still around us. If photons keep losing energy because of the adiabatic expansion of the universe, but they're still around us. And if you ask me how many such photons are still around for 400, uh, I think uh, running out of battery. Yeah. <laughs> it's blinking, it's dying. Uh, yeah. So uh, there are 400 uh, photons from the Big Bang per cubic centimeter. So in this cubic centimeter, you have 400 photons from the Big Bang. They are still with us. Uh, another, there's another thing that's fascinating about this. There are neutrinos also from the Big Bang. And there are 300 neutrinos per cubic centimeter from the Big Bang. Now, if you then ask me, uh, how many atoms are there per cubic centimeter? Uh, now, on Earth, because density is very high, there are so many atoms per cubic centimeter here, but uh, if you go to the outer space in universe, on average, you have only one atom per two billion photons. So if you go to outer space, these photons from the Big Bang are by far the most numerous particles, and they are still with us. 
So atoms are really minority and they were completely dominated by photons. And these cosmic micro background photons are still with us. Now, when the universe was hot, it was a really a hot soup physically. Uh, the physics that determines the uh, properties of cosmic micro background isn't very different from the physics of soup, hot soup. So the universe is made of protons, electrons, and helium nuclei, uh, photons, and neutrinos, and then dark matter. Dark matter that we don't know what that is. Uh, dark matter does not interact with anything, really. Uh, so it, they don't really, really do much, except that uh, they actually provide the gravitational potential, because there are five times more dark matter in mass compared with the uh, usual atoms. So uh, here's a picture. You have a hot soup made of those ingredients like protons and photons and neutrinos, but in order to sustain the uh, soup, you have to have a ball. So that ball is a gravitational potential, and that's provided by dark matter. So you have the uh, ball of dark matter inside of which you have soup. Uh, zuppa. Yeah? Tomate and zuppa, like this. Yeah? So, <laughs> so you have a tomate and zuppa, uh, and inside of which you have these uh, electrons, which are constantly scattering photons when the universe was quite uh, hot. Uh, so this is the opaque universe that you just saw in the movie, but then after the universe cools down to 3,000 kelvins, the universe becomes transparent suddenly. Uh, electrons are now combined into uh, forming neutral hydrogen, and then neutral hydrogen or neutral helium uh, do not scatter photons very much. So that's why photons uh, now propagate freely. And this is the time where we can finally see things using the photons. So these photons will then come to us more or less uh, unperturbed. So these photons directly come to us. And when we take the, uh, these photons, record them and take a photograph, you know, digital camera photograph, then uh, that's really the picture we take. Uh, this is the picture of the universe that we take. I'm going to show it uh, later also in detail. So this is the uh, brief history of the universe. The universe was born here, and then the uh, vertical axis represents some uh, characteristic distances between galaxies. We don't know if the universe is finite, so this is not really the size of the universe, but more like the uh, distances between galaxies, which are getting bigger and bigger as time goes on because of the expansion of space. The universe was born here, somehow, then rapidly expanded, probably. That's, that's what I'm going to tell you now. And then, then photons become, uh, the universe became transparent to photons right here. And that's only 400,000 years after the beginning of the universe. But current uh, age of the universe is 13.7 billion years, billion years. So compared to this, 400,000 years is nothing. So really, we're taking the picture of the baby universe. And these photons directly propagate toward us. And that's why we can really see the universe uh, when he was very young. This is the farthest and oldest light we can ever hope to observe directly, because before this period, the universe was opaque. Photons could not propagate freely. So this is our limit, okay, uh, that we can see directly using photons. But if you could use neutrinos, neutrinos Okay, sure. <laughs> Is this uh, on? Yeah, good, yes. All right, now let me show you uh, how the universe looks uh, in multiple wavelengths. So uh, this is the, our own Milky Way, and then put ourselves into the right location. So that's us. Earth, <laughs> us as well, and put them in where we belong to, and then expand this around. Yeah, there you go. So 
that's our sky, then we go to, uh, now, so this is a visible light. Uh, this is our Milky Way disk. Uh, this is the Magellanic Clouds. And uh, so we are surrounded by sky 360 degrees, but we wanted to expand this around so that we can see the entire sky on one screen. This is the visible light. Uh, then we go to longer wavelength. Can infrared, for example, one micron or so. Then you start seeing this uh, light called the zodiacal light. So this is the uh, uh, light in, due to the uh, interplanetary dust. It's a dust between planets. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the, so this dust uh, is radiated by sunlight and gets scattered and uh, uh, we see it in, in, in an infrared. So this is the stuff that you want to study if you are, if you love it, if you are in love with planets. If you are uh, more like uh, uh, extra galactic astronomers, then this is really annoying. This is really what you just wish you wa was never there. <laughs> okay. Uh, then you will go to uh, uh, far infrared, some millimeter, uh, less than millimeters. Uh, then uh, you see lots of uh, uh, radiation from cold dust uh, in Milky Way. Now, now these, these are all beautiful pictures. You know, these are really coming from the astronomical object inside of our Milky Way. But by the time you go to millimeter, say microwave, that's the sky. Entire sky is filled by cosmic micro background, this fossil light of the Big Bang. It's rather boring, yeah? <laughs> but uh, now you uh, increase the uh, sensitivity of your instrument by a factor of 100,000. Then, you see these ripples, fluctuations. So these are the ripples that existed right after the birth of the universe. And this was discovered first by the NASA's COBE satellite, which was launched in uh, 1989. And it detected this anisotropies uh, at the level of uh, 1,000, 1, 1 part in 100,000 in 1992 and the Kobe team uh, got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Now, uh, I'm in WMAP team. So this is a successor of Kobe satellite. Uh, angular resolution of the instrument is uh, 35 times better. This Kobe satellite had a horn, but WMAP actually have a mirror. So it's a real space telescope. It's a space telescope. You might have heard about Hubble Space Telescope. That's optical telescope. But WMAP is a radio space telescope. And you just have regular parabola antennas that you would use to receive the uh, uh, satellite TV. It's the same technology. Yeah? It's just uh, uh, instead of collecting light from the TV stations, we collect light from the Big Bang. Uh, that's the only small difference. And uh, because uh, we are talking about measuring something that's quite faint, uh, the fluctuations at the level of one part in 100,000, uh, you want to remove this uh, two the three Kelvin background. So the way we do this is the following. Uh, as you might imagine, just finding uh, tiny ripples on top of this big signal is, is difficult. So instead, we do the following. We have two mirrors. Two mirrors are looking at the two different locations in the sky. They are separated by about 140 degrees. Then we take the difference. Because two points in the sky are, are, are measuring the same three Kelvin radiation, plus minus fluctuations, when you take the difference, this mean component drops out and you are only measuring the tiny differences. So this differential measurement was very powerful, very successful uh, uh, for Kobe satellites. So we inherited that technology and WMAP is essentially using the same technology. Now WMAP didn't use, so this WMAP is a, a classical, uh, using classical technique, radio receivers. Uh, no cryogenic components. Uh, it's not cooling, it's not using any coolants, no helium. Uh, so the lifetime of WMAP was quite long. Uh, in fact, it could have gone almost indefinitely. Uh, but, uh, so it was launched in 2001. 
then continue to observe for uh, nine years. Then uh, in 2010, uh, WMAP left the orbit, and then uh, now is living in a happy retirement life. So, so uh, WMAP is, in fact, orbiting at Lagrange 2 point, which is 1.6 million kilometers from Earth. Uh, so WMAP wasn't really circling around the, uh, Earth. Why? Because Earth radiates in microwave. Moon radiates in microwave. Sun radiates in microwave. So you don't want to look at those three bright objects. You want to go somewhere where you can just put everything behind you. Lagrange 2 point is a great place because you can have sun uh, and earth and moon all behind you. And there's an added bonus. We have this sun shield here, which also powers the satellite. So while we are looking in deep into space, opposite of the sun, we are powered by sun. So, uh, uh, but uh, WMAP already left yeah, Lagrange 2 point. There are a couple other satellites are up there. T taking uh, data uh, of other kinds. And uh, we have been having this data releases, series of data releases, and, and uh, uh, last year, uh, the final data set were released and uh, a mission completed. The WMAP science team is about 20 people. Uh, Charles Bennett, uh, professor at the Johns Hopkins University in the United States, he's the PI of the mission. And uh, we have uh, uh, about 20 people, as I said. Now let me show you the data. So WMAP has five frequencies. This is the lowest frequency, 23 gigahertz. And this, the uh, different colors tell you the different temperatures. So red is uh, hotter temperatures, and blue are colder temperatures. And contrast uh, is about uh, 100 micro Kelvin. Yeah, no longer Kelvin, it's micro Kelvin order. And you see this uh, very bright stuff on the galactic plane. Once again, it's the same projection as you saw before. This is our Milky Way. So this light is coming from synchrotron radiation, the electrons going around uh, magnetic fields, uh, radiating the photons. But this synchrotron radiation goes down as you go into higher frequencies. So if you go to, say, 30 gigahertz, a synchrotron radiation goes, goes down. If you go to 40 gigahertz, also, synchrotron goes down. But there's an additional component now that's becoming important, which is the uh, free free emission, or Bremsstrahlung uh, emission, which is the uh, uh, protons uh, accelerating electrons and radiating. So this becomes dominant at about 40 gigahertz. If you go to 60 gigahertz, we really have a little uh, galactic emission. But if you go to the 90 gigahertz, that's the highest frequency we have, then you start seeing a little more emission here, for example. That's coming from thermal dust emission. There's a dust aligned with the galactic plane, uh, magnetic field, and they are heated, and they radiate in this uh, wavelength. So uh, essentially, we have five components in the sky. Cosmic micro background, which is, which is a Planckian, which is a black body spectrum. So the temperature doesn't depend on frequencies. We have synchrotron, which goes down like one over frequency cubed. Free flea uh, goes down like one over frequency square. Dust goes up as frequency square. And there's something funny called spinning dust, which I don't talk about. But we have five, free, five components, and we have five frequencies. So we can separate them using a linear algebra. And then once you clean all this galactic emission, we are left with this a uh, galaxy cleaned map of cosmic micro background. This is, once again, uh, the picture of the universe when the universe is only 400,000 years old. These ripples existed already at that time, and we think these ripples are created as soon as the universe was born. Okay, how do we test that? But uh, before we go into that, I just wanted you to also reflect a little bit upon what you're seeing here, right? So, I mean, astronomers go out to the press and say, oh, discover that, discover that, and we know und we understand the universe, blah, 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 right? And you might start thinking, what are these guys saying, you know? Are they crazy? Are they just making up things? Uh, for example, when I'm talking to my friends at the bar, you know, uh, then they ask me, what are you doing, you know? Okay. I'm studying universe, 
And uh, they say, what universe? And they say, beginning of the universe. They say, oh, crazy, you know, you're making stuff up. We're not. <laughs> we actually see this thing. This is the real stuff. Yeah? So I just wanted you to reflect a little bit upon it. Now, we have the data. What do we do with this? We do the uh, correlation analysis. So now uh, is the time to make sense of these ripples. OK, we understand 2.7 Kelvin, 3 Kelvin component. But what about the fluctuations? How do we make sense of this? What we do is the uh, correlation analysis. So first thing we want to know is whether what we're seeing here is real signal, not noise. If it's noise, there shouldn't be any spatial correlation between those temperatures in the sky. So that's the first thing we want to see. And what we do is the following. We take two points in the sky, then measure temperatures and multiply them together. So in this case, it's cold and cold. So multiply them together, you get positive number. Then you repeat this around this circle here. For example, you call the call, so positive, call the call is positive, call the call is positive. Now, once you average them and you still have positive left, then we say these two points are correlated. Same thing can be said if you have a hot, hot. Average them, and then if you have still positive, it's, it's correlated. Likewise, when you have positive, the negative here and positive here, the product will be negative. And after you average them over, you still get negative, and that's anti-correlation, right? So that still means that the two points are still related to each other. And finally, when you get zero after averaging, so you have positive, cold, cold, so positive, cold, uh, hot, it's negative, then sum everything, and you get zero, there will be no correlation. So that would be noise. That's what you would expect from noise. So is this noise or something more important than noise? Uh, instead of now working with this very intuitive thing, the two-point correlation function in configuration space, we like to think about this in Fourier space. So we first decompose this into spherical harmonic waves, then ask how much power there is per angular scale. So this is the Lugendo uh, polynomials. We decompose this into Lugendo polynomials instead of Fourier series because we're dealing with sky, which is two-dimensional sphere. Uh, so that's what we use. Then this is called the power spectrum, CL. Then L is angular wave number. And just like wave number in Fourier transformation, it's one over length. So in this case, L is simply one over angular separation in the sky. And the, uh, the uh, coefficient is 180 degrees. So first, let me show you what Kobe saw, and how Kobe got the Nobel Prize. This is how he got the Nobel Prize. So uh, the vertical axis is the amplitude of the temperature fluctuations. If it's non-zero, then there is a fluctuation. Uh, it's not noise. And then uh, horizontal axis is the angular wave number. So it's 180 degrees divided by theta. Uh, L equals 2 is called the quadrupole because 180 divided by 2 is 90 degrees. And this is really essentially dividing the sky into four regions. And if it's hot, cold, hot, cold, and that will be quadrupole. Uh, Kobe's angular resolution is about 7 degrees, so it cannot go beyond L of about 20. So that's the limitation of the Kobe. And you see that there are a bunch of data points which are all not zero. And if you fit this to straight line, you have a very significant detection of fluctuation. So this is the evidence that what we're seeing here is not noise. It's a true correlation uh, coming from the early universe. And that's how Kobe got the Nobel Prize. Now, WMAP has 35 time, times better angular resolution. So we can really look at the finer structures and what do we see here. And this is what we see. So this is Kobe. And notice that we have now multiple moments of hundreds or even thousands. And you see this oscillations. It's, it's pretty amazing. Eh? So if you look at uh, this picture, you wouldn't have guessed that uh, oscillation is hidden here. So where does this oscillation come from? Um, then it's now um, 
time to remember what I said. So the early universe is like soup. By the way, is Zuppa the right word or is it Zuppe? Yes. Zuppa, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Zuppe is German. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I forgot to change this miso soup to tomato and zuppa, but uh, anyway, uh, do you know what the miso soup is? <laughs> so miso soup is a Japanese signature uh, soup. Uh, miso is a, a bean paste, soybean paste. It's a brown color soup, anyway. Uh, so uh, universe has a tomato and zuppa, if you like. A main ingredient tomato and a bunch of other things, like basil or uh, other things. Uh, and uh, now, just imagine that you have a tomato in zuppa, then drop tomato, even more tomato, and it makes a ripples. And how ripples propagate depends upon the ingredients, density of the soup. That's exactly what this is telling you. In the universe, universe is made of protons, helium, nuclei, electrons, and photons. Now you put some stones into it, perturb the cosmic hot soup. Then you have these ripples propagating throughout the universe. And its waveform now depends upon how much matter you have in the universe and what kind of matter you have in the universe. Uh, and we measure the composition of the universe by simply analyzing waveforms. Now, if you don't like this uh, tomato and zuppa analogy, you can uh, think about this in terms of the sound. Because what we really think is a sound wave. And you have, say, a water vessel, the flower vessel, made of ceramic, and what the flower vessel made of uh, copper or brass. You hit them, uh, then listen to the sound it creates. Of course, they're different. You can try to analyze the Fourier transform with your sound, and then you see the difference. Why? Because stuff that making the vessel is different. So with cosmic micro background, we can measure the amount of protons in helium nuclei or anything that can interact with photons. We can also measure the amount of dark matter or anything that cannot, in, uh, anything that does not interact with photons, but anything that can contribute to gravitational potential. This ball of soup, yeah? At the time, the universe was, universe was 3,000 kilobits. And one thing important here, actually, is that no matter is left behind. We can detect anything that interacts with photons and anything that doesn't, right? So we have the complete account of all the matter in the universe when the universe was 3,000 kelvins. And uh, without getting into detail, let me just tell you that the first peak to second peak ratio tells you how much atom there is, what? how much stuff that interacts with photons there is. And first peak to third peak ratio now tells you total matter, total gravitational potential. Now the interesting question is, does this number, total matter, agree with number coming from here? Answer is no. They don't match. So this clearly tells you that in the universe, we have some mysterious stuff that does not interact with photons. Because it does not interact with photons, we cannot see them, therefore we call them dark matter. Yeah. But there's no question that they, such a thing exists from this, because no matter is left behind. Now, uh, in addition to matter, we can also uh, get the uh, total the, uh, energy density of the universe as well. So we first have the all this matter, so omega matter is the amount of matter in dimensionless units, so fraction of matter in the total energy density of the universe. And we get that. But what we observe is the, uh, this picture in projection. So we have this acoustic, uh, the oscillation, the acoustic waves, sound waves propagating throughout the universe. But we see them only in angle. So trigonometric geometry, right? So you have something of this size at the distance. And we only look at angle. But if we know the physical size of this, we can get a distance to it. We actually know the physical size of this because there is a finite amount of length that the light could have propagated until the universe becomes transparent. So we know the size of that propagation because we know the age at that time, 380,000 years. Uh, so we know the physical uh, distance uh, and we, we look at the angle, which is about one degree, then we can get the distance. 
this distance is sensitive to the total matter, total energy in the universe. Not just matter, total energy. Uh, so by now measuring distance using this trigonometric geometry, we can now get the total energy density of the universe, and it does not match with what you get for matter. So this is the cosmic inventory. We have atoms which makes up only less than 5% of the total energy in the universe. Matter, so dark matter, 23%. They don't add up to 100%. So what's left? What is it? We don't know, but one thing for sure we know is that it's not matter. <laughs> because if it's matter, we should have seen it already. No matter is left behind. So whatever that's out there cannot be matter. That's why we call this still dark, but no matter. You know, dark, no matter. Well, but it's energy, so it's dark energy. Yeah? <laughs> uh, so after all this, you know, the cosmology is frankly is a quite old subject. And we think we have made a huge progress in our understanding of the universe. Cosmologists are very proud of ourselves. We understand the universe finally, to the point where, <laughs> wait a minute, uh, we, so after all these years, one firm conclusion that cosmologists have come to realize is that we don't understand at all about the universe. 95% of the energy density in the universe is something we do not know. <laughs> dark matter, dark energy. So. Uh, we're, we're in the program, yeah? So we're in deep trouble. <laughs> and understand, so, but we, we measure these things precisely. So that's great. That's a great achievement. And after this, we should just stop measuring things. We have to understand what they are. Now let me tell you how strange the dark energy actually, actually is. So let me first, uh, so it's not matter, yeah? It's some kind of energy. And apparently, with this dark energy, the universe expansion is accelerating. It's actually picking up more velocity. Uh, and let me tell you how strange that is. So, so let me, so before I show this movie, uh, let me uh, tell you this. So dark matter or atoms. Uh, dark matter, we don't understand dark matter, but one thing for sure we understand is it's matter. Therefore, it gives you attractive force. But dark energy is not matter. It turns out that it doesn't give you attractive force. It actually gives you something repulsive. So for example, when uh, this lady was asked to throw an apple uh, like that, then you know, she will be glad to do it, and she gets apple back. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> but when you have a, Dark energy dominated case, then uh, you get an apple. So she's gonna throw up again. Then it will just go up. <laughs> okay, of course, uh, this wouldn't happen on Earth because on Earth, the uh, matter concentrated so much that the density of matter is now winning over the density of dark energy. But if you go out of space, dark energy is the most dominant one. Uh, but this is what would happen uh, if dark energy was still important on Earth. And this is strange, right? And if you think this is strange, you, you are absolutely right. And if you are puzzled, you, you are absolutely right too. And this is the situation. This is totally ridiculous. But uh, we have to live with this because this is what's actually going on in the universe. It's totally against whatever you have learned in high school. You know, the gravity is attractive. <laughs> but uh, now, now there's one thing I wanted to say now, okay? What did you think when you saw this uh, film? If you thought that uh, there is some kind of new force pushing apple to the bug, right? Then you're talking about fifth force. You're talking about modifying Einstein's general relativity. That's one solution, modifying force. Another solution is to say, 
space between Apple and you is expanding faster. This is the property of space, not about force. This is dark energy. This is a new kind of energy that's making the space expand faster. So there are two solutions. One is new force, another is the property of space. Which one is it? We don't know yet. But uh, uh, distinguishing between them is the most important thing that the cosmologists are not pursuing. OK, now, back to the fluctuations, back to the cosmic hot soup. So sound waves are created when we drop the stones into it. But who dropped the stones? What are the stones anyway? <laughs> Unless somebody dropped the stones. So you saw at the beginning of the talk, you saw the movie, right after the beginning of the universe, you already saw some ripples, fluctuations. Who created them? You know, unless there was a, a fluctuation like that, you wouldn't see these uh, uh, cosmic uh, uh, sound waves. Then here comes the theory of the very early universe called cosmic inflation. So in the universe today is accelerating by dark energy. But now we have evidence that universe is also accelerating in a very distant past. In fact, right after the beginning of the universe. So the expansion, according to this scenario proposed in 1980s, expansion of our universe accelerated also in a tiny fraction of a second after its birth. And this inflation stretches truly microscopic scale to macroscopic scale. And let me tell you that in tiny fraction of a second, like 10 to the minus 36 seconds, universe expanded by at least 6, 26 orders of magnitude. In a tiny, tiny fraction of a second, size of an atomic nucleus becomes size of the solar system. Now, if you think it's crazy, you're absolutely right. This is a totally crazy thing that uh, one can ever hope to come up with. But uh, uh, now we can test this hypothesis using data. So that's a truly remarkable thing. Uh, this scenario was proposed uh, 30 years ago. Now finally approaching the period where we can test this observationally. So let me come back to this, uh, uh, the power spectrum again. So you see ripples. Now we understand that these ripples will tell you about amount of matter in the universe, amount of dark energy, and so forth. We measure them already from the peak ratios. Now that we measure them already, why don't we just take them away? And this would be the uh, spectrum, still non-zero, right? This is not zero. We just got rid of this, uh, 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 ripples created by uh, the sound speed, sound uh, waves. Now this is the spectrum of the primordial ripples. So fluctuation is equal amplitude at everywhere, at all multiples. But early universe didn't have to do this. Early universe could have put more stones on small scales than large scales. Or primordial universe could have put more stones on larger scales than small scales. So we parameterize this by power law. So amplitude of the perturbation is now proportional to multiples to some power. And when this power is zero, we have an equal amplitude of fluctuations at all scales. This is called the scalar invariant spectrum. And inflation predicts that uh, what we should see, something like this. So this NS is one, is the uh, scalar invariant spectrum. No, uh, so the fluctuations are equal amplitude at all scales. So inflation predicts that NS is one, but not exactly one. So theory of the early universe says uh, the primordial ripples, now here's even crazier thing, right? So, so the inflation says the following. In a tiny fraction of a second, something at the quantum world, micro, microscopic, microscopic world, will become a size of a solar system. So it gives you the mag quantum magnifier. And something tiny like quantum fluctuations are produced on small scales, and they're rapidly stretched to large scales and become classical objects like galaxies. So this inflation tells you that 
galaxies were created out of quantum fluctuations. Something truly ridiculous. Huh? We, human beings, also are products of quantum fluctuations in the early universe. That's what this is telling you. And uh, how this power of the quantum fluctuation distributed over scales is determined by expansion history during cosmic inflation. Now, because inflation has to end at some point, expansion rate during inflation has to be going down. So universe was born, inflated, but this inflation doesn't last forever. Uh, this expansion rate has to go down over time, and then inflation stops. So inflation tells you that this NS should be less than one. That's what the prediction is. It is something we can test. So uh, to repeat, um, Heisenberg uncertainty principle is at work. And it, this is what, we, what created us. So you borrow a lot of energy from the vacuum if you promise to return it to the vacuum immediately. And the amount of uh, energy you can borrow is inversely proportional to the time for which you borrow the energy from, from vacuum. If it's complicated, let me just give you the analogy to the bank. So you go to the bank, and then uh, you ask for uh, one euro. And you wanted to borrow one euro for, say, one hour. And they will be glad to borrow, they lend you one euro, probably. Yeah? But if you now go to the bank again and say, can I borrow one million euro for one hour? And they will think you're crazy, and they will call you ambulance. Yeah? Uh, but if you promise to return it in one second, they are glad to lend you one million, and you, one second later, you bring it back. Right, so get one euro, uh, one million euro, then return one million euro, eh? and they, they call you ambulance again. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how it works here. Uh, and uh, as soon as the fluctuations are created inside of this uh, uh, small patch in the universe, it gets stretched into the cosmic scales. Now, why is this relevant? So I told you that uh, you can borrow a lot of energy if you promise to return it immediately. And this happens when the universe is 10 to the minus 36 seconds. One over this small number is gigantic number. In fact, uh, in, in natural unit, this uh, time scale corresponds to 10 to the 12 GeV. Some, something ginormous. Very, very big number. Uh, because the universe was very, very young, uh, you could have amplified uh, lots of quantum fluctuations. And uh, that's the origin of ourselves. So inflation offers a magnifier for microscopic world. And uh, measurement of NS is the key. So with doubling up data alone, we could determine that NS is something like 0.97 plus minus 0.01. So it's not three sigma. It's barely three sigma. Huh? Then you can extend, because what you're trying to do is to figure out whether you have more power on small scales or more power on larger scales. If you have more multiples, you can do better job. And this is doubling up data. And you have other measurements coming from the ground-based telescope. For example, South Pole Telescope in South Pole, Atacama Cosmology Telescope in Chile. And they have this beautiful measurement from the ground on small scales. And with this, you can do the better job. So you have the NS, now 0.96 plus minus 0.01. And so it's 3.5 sigma. Not 5 sigma yet. Uh, so you cannot claim the victory just yet. But then this uh, uh, successor of the WMAP, in fact, this time is a European satellite. So European Space Agency's Planck satellite, which was also observing cosmic micro background at Lagrange 2 point. In fact, the reason why WMAP stopped observing at nine years is that uh, Planck was launched and proven to be quite successful. So once we heard that Planck was good, doing well, we decided uh, not to collide with Planck, but uh, <laughs> to leave the orbit, grass, you know, uh, and uh, what is it, uh, gracefully, <laughs> and then we put in the retirement orbit. Uh, now Planck result came out uh, March 21st, hmm? what, 14th? I forgot. But uh, this year, March, uh, 
a half year ago, a Planck result was released, and look at this, this is the result. Amazing. Yeah? Uh, compared to this, that's the result. With this, you now claim a victory. Yeah? More than five sigma, cosmic microbacter data alone, NS is less than one. Now, uh, I know that this is a somewhat complicated process, but let me just tell you, we cannot overemphasize the importance of this result. This is not the definitive proof that, not yet, the inflation happened, but this is a very, very strong evidence that the inflation actually happened, and we are indeed children of quantum fluctuations. So for cosmologists, five sigma discovery of NS less than one, 0.96 is as important as the discovery of Higgs particle. This is the milestone, major milestone, major, major milestone. Uh, plan cost a couple of billion euros, but uh, it was worth it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, I'm, I guess I have three minutes or so. So let me just tell you what the future is. So has inflation occurred? We don't know yet for sure. This is something we just cannot write on children's textbook just yet. Not yet. Close, but not yet. So inflation predicts also that uh, there are ripples in space-time. Not just matter, but space-time. We call this gravitational wave. So when I wave my hands, you're receiving gravitational waves from me. You know, I'm perturbing space like this. And then if you have a wave like this, then you create a wave, I create a wave, you're receiving it. It's tiny, so you don't feel it, but it's there. In the early universe, uh, the early universe is very chaotic. So uh, quantum fluctuations also were amplified and gravitational waves are produced. Copious amount of gravitational waves are produced. And the gravitational waves stretch space in this way. So you had a ring of particles. Uh, so let me just uh, go to go to just this, uh, sorry, sorry, just this, yeah? So let's say uh, gravitational waves are coming toward you, and you have a ring of particles in front of you, and watch how they move. And that's how they move. And there are two polarization states of the gravitational waves. One is stretching space vertically, another is st uh, stretching space 45 degrees uh, tilted. And this is wonderful because uh, let's put an electrons at the middle of this, and from point of view of electron, space was just being stretched this direction, or that direction. And because space was stretched, the photons get redshifted. The wavelengths of our photons are now stretched in this direction. So photons from here are colder. Their wavelengths got stretched. Frequency goes down, energy goes down, they're colder. It's hotter here, so it automatically generates temperature fluctuations. This is something we can measure also. And uh, by uh, quantifying this uh, power in gravitational waves, the, uh, so we divide the power in gravitational waves by power in gravitational potential, we get this dimensionless quantity called R, and inflation predicts R less than one. We haven't found this gravitational waves yet, but now we have this phase diagram where vertical axis is uh, this R, gravitational wave amplitude, relative to the uh, gravitational potential. X axis is this uh, uh, famous NS. Then we have this exclusion plot. So this is 68% confidence level, this is 95% confidence level, and there are a bunch of points here. These are predictions from some of the representative models of inflation. Inflation happens when the uh, energy of the universe was gut scale. Grand unification scale, 10 to the 16 GeV, something that you never be able to uh, achieve on Earth. The highest energy that human beings have ever achieved is one TeV, well, more like seven TeV, uh, in Geneva. This is all the magnitude greater. And look, these models are now gone. You're not allowed to talk about this anymore. You you'll be arrested. Yeah, but this was decent, you know. High energy physics model based upon harmless, uh, you know, quartic uh, uh, interaction of the scalar fields. There's not, no reason to exclude this unless you have the data. We have the data now. 
And these are some of the models that are still allowed by data, but you know, we, as time goes by, the uh, data get better and uh, more models are being excluded. Now, uh, well, we haven't found gravitational waves yet, but we keep pushing this, and then uh, I don't now have time to talk about this, uh, but uh, the next holy grail, next uh, goal is to really detect this primordial gravitational wave, wave from inflation. How do we do this? We use photon polarization. So cosmic micro background are polarized. Uh, when you look at the cosmic micro background, some of the photons are oscillating in this direction preferentially than this direction. So when photons are oscillating primarily this direction, we say, oh, uh -huh, it's polarized this way, or that way, or that way, or that way. And this is something we can measure. Um, and uh, so I skipped the details, but uh, essentially what I want to say is, once again, this is the polarization states, and uh, uh, we put uh, electrons in the middle, and you have this cold uh, photons coming from the above, hot uh, photons coming from the uh, horizontal direction, and you, now you can compute polarization of the uh, photons. So uh, cold uh, photons are coming from above, hot uh, photons are coming from the right. They will now go to the electron and get scattered. The physics of Thomson scattering is such that when you have uh, photons oscillating this direction and you get scattered, and this oscillation will come to you like this. But photon oscillating this direction get scattered, it cannot come to you because this would not be <laughs> this will not be a transverse wave. You have to have the oscillation this way, not this way, because photons are massless. You cannot have this longitudinal oscillation. In any case, uh, so the physics tells you that uh, when you have hotter photons coming from here and coming toward you, the oscillation is bigger. Colder photons coming from the above and get scattered like this. So this oscillation will be now smaller. So if you now compute the direction of polarization, you get this kind of direction. So, uh, gravitation wave of this type will produce vertical polarization. Gravitation wave of this type will produce 45 degree tilted uh, polarization. And the important thing is, you always get these two distinct modes of gravitational waves. If you have one, you have, you have to have another. In other words, when you have one direction of polarization in cosmic micro background, you have to also have 45 degree tilted version. And uh, we have this jargon uh, called E mode and B mode of the polarization. And uh, uh, gravitational potential also produced something called E mode polarization pattern. I don't have time to talk about this in detail, but just uh, trust me that uh, when you don't have gravitational waves, only gravitational potential, you don't generate this kind of uh, vorticity looking patterns, but only this kind of radial or tangential patterns. This is called E mode. This has been measured. Uh, but uh, because if you have one polarization like this, you get 45 degree tilted version if you have a gravitational waves. So gravitational waves can generate both E mode and B mode. So we don't have measurement of B mode yet. These are all upper bounds. E mode has been measured with very high significance. We know, therefore, that uh, cosmic micro background photons are polarized. This is a prediction for gravitational potential, and the measurements match with uh, prediction, which is great. But we haven't found this beam on the spectrum yet. Detecting this would be the next big thing. And uh, so uh, there are a few. So who is going to launch the success of Planck? So Planck. It's up there, measure things, but uh, polarization capability of a plant isn't enough to detect these gravitational waves, unfortunately. So uh, we have to have new experiments. And one of the experimental concepts that uh, I'm developing with my colleagues in Japan is light bird. And this is the attack, so this is the next generation cosmic micro background satellite dedicated to polarization. So we try to measure polarization very, very precisely. And now current upper bound on R, this gravitational wave amplitude, is 
or point one, rather. We want to improve this by two order of magnitude. We expect to find gravitational waves at this level. Once we find it, that will be the time we finally declare that inflation has happened. This was the beginning of our universe. And we all children of quantum fluctuations, and then we put that into the children's textbook. So we declare victory. When, does we, when is it going to happen? So this experiment isn't funded yet, but we expect to launch it in 2020. So stay tuned. And uh, so that's a summary. So WMAP has completed nine years of observations, and uh, we learned so much about the universe already from the satellite. We could determine the age, so 13.7 billion years old. Composition, 95% is unknown, mysterious stuff. Expansion right of universes, uh, et cetera. But uh, personally, I was very excited about this possibility that uh, we can use cosmic micro background to learn something about the earliest moment of the universe, beginning, birth of the universe. And we declared the victory now, recently. And S is less than one. Uh, with more than five sigma. So we have a very strong evidence that the inflation has happened, but to definitely secure the statement that the inflation has happened, we will find polarization in cosmic micro background from gravitational waves. That's it. Thank you very much. So Planck does have a capability to measure polarization, and it's going to do a fantastic job in measuring this E-mode spectrum on small scales. But uh, uh, for this gravitational wave origin polarization, it's probably going to be very difficult to see. So we already have fairly good upper limit, uh, and the Planck's polarization capability is not really able to measure that level of polarization, B-mode polarization. Yeah. So next year, Planck will release the polarization results. But uh, you, we, I don't think we will be able to find B mode polarization from inflation. Probably find polarization from other things, but not from inflation yet. To get that, you have to have a next generation experiment. Can you comment on the um, uh, claim the um, Lack of uh, of uh, uh, um, um, power power on uh, on large scales. Yes. Yes. So somehow this keeps coming up, but uh, repeatedly. But uh, pretty much every time we write W papers, we say lack of power is not statistically significant. There's a, if you draw a dice, you know, do Monte Carlo simulations. You have 10% of the time you get this kind of uh, lack of power on large scales. It's just that, uh, so uh, his question is about this. Um, so we have this power spectrum of cosmic micro background. And uh, if you look carefully, uh, here is a data point here. Right? <laughs> In theory predicts this one. So on very large scale, there seems that uh, data points are quite uh, below compared to the best fit. But error over there is huge. So, 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 that, 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 so, so uh, the, our answer is that um, lack of power is not statistically significant at all. So, so that's, that's the situation, yes. Because uh, uh, somebody claims that if you see the things uh, at the level of the two-point function, the, the one that you showed uh, yeah. at the very beginning, like the, the literal two-point uh, function as a function of the angle, yes, yes. then the thing is even uh, stronger or bigger. Uh, but again, uh, yes. yeah, but we don't think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit 
the error box. So yes. I understand why the resolution, the angular resolution is better, but I don't really understand how the error box. Could. Very good. So, uh, um, um, so here's how it works. So uh, we measure spherical harmonic coefficients. L of two, we have five m's. So m of minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two. So we have five things. Now, we take the uh, square of this spherical harmonic coefficients. Then, so we have five measurements. Yeah? m equals minus two. But then, assuming that the universe does not have a preferred direction, we average all the m's. So you average five data points. But because we have only five data points, <laughs> error bar is large. It's like we're trying to measure the variance of temperature fluctuations. And I, I, actually, I have an excellent way to explain this. Uh, so uh, because we are trying to measure the variance, this is the uh, temperature and isotropy, temperature. And we have a distribution. I'm sorry, this is the histogram. So this is the uh, uh, number of data. And this is the temperature value. And it centers at zero. And we're trying to measure the variance here. But at L equals two, we have only five numbers. <laughs> and uh, we're trying to determine variance simply from five measurements, and that's difficult. So on large scales, we have gigantic error bars because of that. But as you go to smaller scales, as you increase L, the number of M's you can average over increases. So therefore, the uh, error bar decreases uh, as one over square root of L. So that's the, so, so the, in other words, these uh, Error bars are not determined by our instruments. These are actually determined by the fact that we have only one universe. Yeah, so it's called cosmic variance. That's the origin of the error bars. Yeah. You did not mention the issue of non-Gaussianity. Yes, right. Can you comment on that? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so uh, non-Gaussianity is something I made a career of, so I have to. <laughs> Uh, I, so uh, what is non-Gaussianity? So uh, let's come back to this, actually. Uh, so I, I draw a Gaussian here, right? But there's a reason why we draw Gaussian here. Because first of all, if you look at the data, the data do prefer Gaussian distribution for uh, temperature fluctuations. Now, what's a big deal? Uh, have you ever seen Gaussian in your life? Uh, not often, right? So uh, you see Gaussian only for noise, but for something truly signal-like thing, we don't see Gaussian. But if you look at the cosmic micro background map, it's really Gaussian. Gaussian to the level of 0.1% precision. This is the most Gaussian thing I've ever seen in my life, right? except for noise. So there must be some deep reason for it. You know, why is it Gaussian? If you have a superposition of things, then uh, Gauss tells you that uh, according to the center limit theorem, you should get the Gaussian. But it was one universe. You know, there's no average of anything. Then here comes inflation again. Inflation tells you that uh, you are looking at quantum fluctuations. Now, but not just any quantum fluctuations. These are quantum fluctuations of vacuum. So these are vacuum fluctuations in the ground state. That's the prediction. Now, if you write down Schrodinger's equation, harmonic potential, and compute the wave function of a ground state of a free field, no interacting quantum fields, you get the Gaussian. So wave function of the quantum fluctuations has to be Gaussian if inflation is correct. Namely, once again, you are looking at the quantum fluctuations in vacuum in ground state. That's the prediction. Uh, and we see it. So this is another very important piece of evidence that uh, this statement, crazy statement that we are born out of quantum fluctuation in vacuum ground state is true. 
Now, uh, however, if you turn this around, this Gaussianity, you know, better shape, offers you a wonderful way to rule out inflation. If you see deviations from Gaussian distributions, you can rule out a good chunk of inflation models. Not all of them, but most of them. Th that's how I made my career, essentially looking for this uh, uh, deviation from Gaussianity. And I I'm happy to report that after 10 years of my research life, I found nothing. <laughs> and <laughs> absolutely nothing, and uh, we confirm that the inflation is a very good uh, proposal. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>